Um, so Lynn Ritz is from Revelstoke. She is a veterinary assistant. She has worked as a health and safety coordinator and a worker at Brinkman Reforestation. And um, Celine is bringing up her faithful assistance, assistant, a fine and noble creature by the name of Fella. Um, for $5 per person, Fella will clean out both ears. So I've already taken advantage of these services. It is wonderful. My ears are now sparkling clean. Now, I do realize that dogs in the workplace isn't every company and it isn't every sector, but it is a big part of tree planting. I see it in brushing. I certainly see it in consultant forestry. And there's always going to be dogs in the workplace, from my understanding of it. There's going to be places where dogs are here. If we're going to have dogs in the workplace, we should be looking at what we can do to also take care of the bodies, minds, and souls of dogs. They have souls. They have minds. They have all of these things. And if we care for them, if we have safer dogs, we will have safer workplaces. So I would like to welcome up Celine and Fella. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Uh, where is the camera, Jordan? Or where am I looking at there? Okay, with these guys. I hope they can see Fella. That was one thing I was thinking about before this presentation. I hope he's tall enough. Okay, I'm Celine. Thank you for the introduction, Jordan. Uh, and this is Fella. He is my three-year-old German Shepherd elk hound. He's accompanied me on several seasons in the bush and accompanied me in that photo there and is accompanying me today on this presentation that is very near and dear to my heart dogs and their safety in our workplaces. Oh, I might need... I got a lot of things that I'm juggling here. You can see it's a lot of work having a dog around. Okay, so a little bit about myself. I own and operate a pet safety business in Revelstoke, BC. I specialize in the care and management of dogs in outdoor environments. So that's working dogs, hunting dogs, search and rescue dogs, our dogs, our tree planting dogs, all of our bush dogs, um, and really any dog that accompanies their owner into the backcountry because I see that they um, are endangered at times and there is a lot that we can do to care for them better. Um, I studied pre-veterinary animal sciences at the University of Vermont. Since graduating, I've worked in several different vet clinics, both in like a large urban emergency care center, as well as smaller uh, rural practices. I'm really passionate about education and outreach because I can just see how far reaching those efforts are. And I really wanna get to the right people, get this information out to them. Um, I've worked in uh, silviculture for 10 years now, coming into 11 years, uh, primarily with Brinkman as a planter, checker, foreman, OHS advisor, and kind of the self appointed dog first aider. Um, and so I really see that there are a lot of dogs in our communities, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation with you guys. Um, just a couple more things to round out my experiences. Um, I am a dog sled musher. Um, I'm also a scoop ski patroller at the Revelstoke Mountain Resort. So I, I come with a lot of first aid uh, training as well as experiences both in a clinical setting and uh, personal lived experiences. So dogs are a real integral part of the history, the work culture and the community in our industry. Um, I would love to see just a raise of hands. How many of us are actually dog owners here or have dog friendly work sites? Okay. We're in good company. This is great news. Okay. So yeah, they're, they're with us and they always have been. They're, they're wonderful companions. Um, I know Fella is truly my best friend and I'm very grateful that I get to share my work with him. Um, excuse me. Sorry, I'm a little bit nervous about this because it's very important to me. Um, yeah, so dogs, you know, have been a part of our workplaces for a long time. Uh, there is something really to be said about the the bond that we have with our, our dogs, especially our workers. I think a lot of that has to do with the, the mutual reliance we have. Uh, you know, they rely on us for very basic things, food, water, shelter. Uh, in return, we get unconditional love and loyalty, which is a pretty good deal for us. Uh, and, and we rely on them. We rely on them for companionship uh, in the bush. Uh, for safety. I know speaking uh, as a checker, I am often by myself all day long. Um, and in our contract in Fernie, I am alone uh, in places that are very frequent, uh, or like I'm visited frequently by grizzly bears. So it, it's very common that I am 
um, kind of endangered in that way. Um, and so having a dog is really something that I value to keep me safe in my work site. Ideally, they keep us, um, you know, boost morale and keep everybody happy, but that's not always the case. Um, I Bringing up this conversation of dogs in the work site, I do field a lot of complaints, a lot of concerns with people saying this, you know, an industrial work site is no place for a dog. I really do validate those concerns. I understand that, you know, it is a very um, challenging thing to have a dog uh, safely in, in our work sites. Uh, and so there's a lot that we can do to improve on that. Yeah, there. I might just need to step down so I can see this here. Uh, so currently there are a few um, issues that I see in our industry. Uh, there's a real inadequate, uh, sorry, I just can't really see this, uh, inadequate owner awareness and accountability. So we're really lacking owners taking that initiative. What's that, Jordan? Yeah, there we go. Yeah, sorry, it just wasn't loading on here. Okay, so now this is different from what I'm seeing. Okay, sorry, guys. Okay. Uh, inconsistent policies for the inclusion of animals in camp um, and the execution of those policies, uh, as well as uh, lack of standardized training uh, or supplies to address dog safety. So that would be first aid training, um, and the supplies that go with that. So some current hazards here in our industry. Um, I can only just brush on a couple here. I, I can't really get into it too much just with the time that I have with you guys. Uh, but first and foremost, human safety is our top priority. Um, that's really the, the number one thing that we need to be considering with dogs in, in our workplaces. Um, undesirable or dangerous behavior, I feel like that's a very common one. We see dogs that are quite unruly, uh, they can act aggressively or, or dangerously. And, and really to that, uh, we need to consider that some of these dogs are put in environments where they feel unsafe, they're overstimulated, they might not be receiving the discipline that they need to be in that environment safely. So we really need to acknowledge that. Uh, injuries and illnesses. Unfortunately, I, I see that most people are pretty ill-prepared and ill-equipped to deal with injuries and illnesses with dogs. Uh, so really bringing some awareness to that here. For property damage, um, I think it, you know, with my dog, he has damaged uh, some things in the past. And so to really be aware that the owner assumes liability when their dog uh, damages any sort of property. Okay, so just a couple pictures here, the things that our dogs as well as us can sustain uh, while we're, you know, out in the woods with our dog. Uh, bite wounds, this is a big one, and the management of that. Uh, this is a concern for humans as well. Uh, you can see here those bite wounds are quite easily hidden under the fur of an animal. And those bite wounds there on the hands, uh, that lower one is actually my own. Um, I was bit, trying to split up a dog fight, and yeah, that was an injury that I sustained from a dog. Some other things our dogs may encounter, uh, biting and stinging insects, uh, snakes, spiders, toads, that sort of thing. Um, ticks, that's a big concern because primarily the zoonotic transmission or the risk thereof. Uh, those two dogs there have some form of like an anaphylactic reaction. So I think that guy down there might have eaten a bee or some, some sort of stinging insect. Uh, but when this happens and we're really far away from help, um, we really need to consider what, what sort of actions we're going to take with our animals and, and how we're going to manage this. Okay, so this dog was injured, uh, this one on the left here. Uh, from walking in a fairly moderately slashy block, it wasn't even really that uh, bad. However, it is a pretty major wound, and, and the people that were handling that dog, uh, it was a pretty scary thing for them to experience. So... Uh, that dog did end up needing uh, several stitches. Um, here, I know it is kind of a graphic photo. Do you guys, are you guys aware of what that is happening, that flap avulsion, how that could have happened? Uh, so that's hot asphalt, like walking on hot tarmac or hot asphalt as well as hot rock. Uh, we commonly see um, like paw lacerations, nail uh, wounds, that sort of thing. Um, Fella, actually, my dog got stepped on by someone with fresh corks when he was a puppy, um, and that punctured right through his paw, and that became very infected, and it was a very difficult thing for me to manage um, in the bush. 
A few other uh, environmental things. Yeah, sorry guys, I know it's hard to look at, but it's important that we see these things so that we're considering this. Uh, porcupine quills. My dog got quilled twice in one day uh, this summer. That was really not that fun. Uh, burns, so that would be thermal uh, and chemical burns. So this is a cherry picker's dog in the Okanagan. They had to evacuate uh, because of an encroach encroaching wildfire. The dog escaped or it darted. Um, and they came back three days later, and this these were the burns that that dog had sustained. Um, swimming or drinking stagnant bodies of water. Does everyone know blue-green algae, the risks of that? Yeah, so that can actually be toxic and, and even lethal to dogs. So we come across those types of bodies of water all the time where, where we're working in the summer. Um, something as simple as a grass seed. So they're really minor, or they look very unassuming, um, but they can cause a lot of irritation and even yeah, a lot of problems if they're not detected early. You can see that grass seed has made its way all the way into the dog's ear, um, nose. That would be incredibly uncomfortable. Um, and then this picture of a moose. Has anyone seen this or heard about this article? Okay. Um, so this was a dog sledding team uh, in Alaska. Uh, the moose actually did end up trampling them and, and staying over top of them for, for several hours. Um, so the owners weren't actually able, even despite shooting the moose or shooting at the moose, they weren't actually able to get this moose uh, off of their dogs, which um, ended up in a lot of major, uh, a lot of injuries for these dogs. So um, large apex predators is also something that we really are, are concerned about with our dogs in the field. So we want to get in front of the ball here. We want to empower our workers and ideally you guys to make the considerations or, or bring these considerations uh, into our preseason planning. All right, so some preseason uh, preparation. Um, ideally, every dog will have a, like a written, signed approval from a manager uh, prior to being uh, welcomed or approved onto our work sites. Um, contracted accountability. So this would be a code of conduct for how we would expect owners to uh, behave and as well as their dogs. Uh, disciplinary steps, so that would include, you know, maybe a verbal warning with some recommendations for how to mitigate that behavior or, or problem that we're seeing. Written warning, perhaps with some loss of privileges. Um, and then expulsion from camp. It, it is a privilege to have a dog in a work site like ours, so we need to ensure that people are taking it seriously and that privilege can be revoked. Um, an exit plan would be a strategy uh, where the owner would have a predetermined guardian uh, in the event th that the dog was expelled from camp, uh, that the guardian could take the dog over um, so that the dog is not staying in camp. Uh, Pre-arrival checklists and resources. So education is, again, like I was saying, is very key to empowering our owners to make better decisions. Uh, so there's lots of resources that we can provide them for uh, risk assessments, uh, checklists, packing lists, as well as some safety resources so that we can get uh, everyone on the same page here. So what a preseason checklist might look like, uh, veterinary visits. So we really want our dogs to be seen by a vet prior to coming to camp. This ensures they're getting the right vaccines uh, and parasite treatment. Um, Adequate nutrition and hydration. A dog can eat up to 50% more uh, of their regular caloric intake when they're really exerting themselves. Hydration, they can, you know, dogs can drink up to four liters of water on a hot day. Uh, so we really need to consider that they have nutritional requirements too. Um, muzzle. So muzzle is um, a real safety precaution for us. I would like to see every dog owner um, have a muzzle that's properly fitted to their dog every time they enter our work sites or have that kind of in their first aid kit. Um, a muzzle is essentially something that will protect us because a dog, an injured dog or a dog in fear uh, will lose its bite inhibition if it's injured or if it's in, yeah, in a lot of fear. Um, Robin, if you wouldn't mind show, holding my microphone for a second. I'm gonna just show you quickly um, a couple different yeah, things, Robin. A couple different types of muzzles. A basket muzzle, so this is great because it still allows the dog to pant. A nylon muzzle, uh, much smaller. I actually carry one of these in my chest pack. If we don't have a muzzle, 
One of these triangular bandages that we always have in our first aid kits um, can actually be used in a way, if I can, if you guys can see Fella. You wanna sit up? You wanna sit up? <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so hopefully he's tall enough for you guys to see this. Um, but a, a muzzle can be tied around the dog. I know. Tied above. Tied below. Tied around. Thanks. So it's not perfect, um, but it ensures that we are completely mitigating the risk of being bit. Um, it is something that is very uh, common with injured animals that they want to bite as that fight, flight, or fight, or sorry, fight, flight, or freeze response. Um, and yeah, instilling that everyone has a muzzle prepared ahead of time um, is a great way to make sure that everyone yeah, is aware of that. How well do you know your breed? So not to get too heavy in the breed conversation here, because I know everyone is very defensive of certain breeds, um, but we do see a lot of certain behaviors exhibited from certain breeds. So for example, herding type breeds, so blue healers, border collies, they love to nip, they love to chase things. So we see a lot of issues with them chasing people on bikes in camp, um, uh, tree runners or people on quads or even vehicles. Um, we see, such as this puppy, this livestock guardian dog, um, they are bred to protect their livestock and their family at all costs. Um, so we see a lot of territorial behavior from dogs like this. Um, huskies are fiercely independent, and their recall maybe isn't always the greatest thing, so another thing. Um, ironically, working uh, as a veterinarian's assistant, I have seen a lot of different behaviors exhibited from lots of different breeds, um, one of the most uh, non-compliant uh, and overtly aggressive dogs that I've handled are actually doodle breeds. So I'm not trying to blame any sort of certain breed, but just so, yeah, something that we're aware of that that breed does play into their behavior. Okay, so a behavioral assessment that we could, you know, encourage our workers to do prior to coming to camp. Uh, this is a sea bark assessment. So this is a free online assessment. It takes about 15 minutes. Um, I did this for Fella. Obviously, if I actually did it for him, he'd score all green. Um, but I just wanted to go all across the board to kind of outline what um, kind of some common concerning behavior might look like in a visual representation. Uh, so this would give you a really clear visual outline of, of any sort of um, concerning behaviors. Um, if we could pr have workers present that to management prior to coming to camp, maybe that would bring some more awareness to the behaviors that they're struggling with, um, or perhaps just be reason to not include them in the first place. So some camp safety. So the safety board is a wonderful resource. We already have that up. Um, so let's add some couple or a couple dog related uh, notices. So information regarding the nearest vet clinic and the nearest 24 hour emergency care center, because those are often, you know, not even the same clinics, but also maybe not even in the same towns. Um, so phone numbers, hours of operation, uh, travel time and direction to clinic would be a great thing to include on that. Designated lead roles in the event of an emergency. Uh, and this pet poison helpline, has anyone heard of that? No, okay. Um, so it's a 24 hour helpline where you can call uh, specifically for animals with suspected or known poisoning or toxicosis. And you'll be put on the phone, it's a, I believe $59 charge, um, but immediately on with a veterinarian who specializes in this. You tell them what the dog ate, how much of it, how long ago. Um, and they will tell you based on the dog's age and size uh, if this is a true emergency and they need to be rushed to a vet clinic or if it's something that you can manage um, in your camp. So we have a lot of uh, poisonous things in our camp, chocolate, raisins, uh, marijuana, antifreeze, rodenticide. There's, you know, the list goes on. So uh, this is especially important because poisonings are very time sensitive. Um, and we really need to make sure that, uh, yeah, if there is any sort of ingestion, uh, that we can call in the resources that we need to, to uh, manage it. Um, evacuation planning, emergency response plans, and emergency drills involving dogs. I don't know, has anyone ever done an emergency 
drill involving an injured dog? No. Yeah, no. I wouldn't imagine. It's not really, yeah, something we think of, but people respond with a real heightened sense of worry and anxiety when an animal is injured, especially their own. Um, I've seen people completely unravel when they see their dogs get hurt. And so for all of this emergency planning that we've done um, with humans, we need to include that for our dogs. And we need to encourage that, um, that training and that foresight to make it something that is much less scary uh, when we're actually dealing with our, with our animals when they're hurt. All right, some site safety. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's Fella and his puppy friend. Uh, I'd love to see some um, really hard and fast no's. I think we can do a bit better as management to be a bit more discerning with the dogs that we allow into our work sites. Ideally, no human aggressive dogs. Puppies, yes, they're super cute, um, but a forestry work site is no place for a dog. Um, you know, it's just very challenging to deal with a puppy in general. And uh, yeah, a work site is not really the best place for it. Some people will argue that with me, but uh, you know, even something like their joint health, puppies are still growing and over-exercising them can lead to a lifetime of compromised joint health. So we really want to ensure that the dogs that are in our camp are physically fit and capable of being in the bush. Inexperienced or new workers, there's a lot to learn as a first-time dog owner. The bush is not really the place for it, or a work site is not really the place for it. Um, the slide did get cut off down here, but lack of proof of veterinary uh, records and up-to-date uh, vaccines and medications. So we really want to make sure that the dogs that are coming to our camps have been vetted, that they're healthy, and that they um, have the vaccines that they need. Um, disease uh, transmission is definitely something that you know we're all aware of as humans, but that's also something that we... Um, deal with with dogs in our work sites. Okay, so a couple yes uh, that I would love to see. High visibility identification, so something as simple as flagging tape. Um, personally, I, I did have a tree planter friend in Revelstoke whose dog was shot mistakenly as a, a farmer thought it was a, a wolf or a coyote on their property, and it did uh, sadly pass away from that. Um, so yeah, high visibility flagging is, or even like a high visibility vest, something that we can see the dogs from a, a distance away. A safe home environment to decompress. Uh, so some dogs act, you know, in not great ways and they can be a real nuisance. Sometimes that's because they're very overstimulated. They're very overwhelmed. They're tired. They're fatigued, just like us. So we need to ensure that our workers are providing them a safe place to decompress um, and rest. And communication prior to escalation. Um, this is so important because I, I see that there's a real like blaming and shaming culture around dogs. People love blaming each other for doing the wrong thing um, or you know, blaming the dog. I do understand that it is a dog problem. However, it is very much more a dog owner problem. So we need to be able to communicate our concerns with our workers, with our dog owners, um, so that we can all have a certain, like a, a clear line of communication prior to having things escalate. All right, so some safety in and around work vehicles. So there is some OHS regulation uh, that is already structured around dogs being transported in vehicles. An animal must not be carried in the operator's cab or passenger compartment of a vehicle transporting workers unless appropriate facilities are provided for this, pur for this purpose. That can be kind of lost in translation a bit. Um, ideally, a dog is transported in a crate that is securely contained in a cab of a truck. The next best thing would be a harness with a seatbelt attachment. We don't have the room for that in most of our work trucks. Um, so having dogs uh, like this fella down here, kind of lower down, if an owner can safely contain their dog and have them not be a nuisance in a work vehicle, that's ideal. Problem that we see is dogs that are anxious, that they're running around on people's laps, they're soaking wet, they're dirty, they're eating people's food. Um, and so that, yeah, that I recognize that that is a real problem. Um, and so, yeah, building some, some conversations about how people feel safe having dogs in vehicles. Um, circle check. Sadly, some of the most horrific accidents I've seen in the bush, as well as in a clinical setting, involve dog, or dogs under vehicles getting run over. 
Um, in our tree plant, or sorry, in our uh, dog sledding trucks, we have a large neon uh, sign on every steering wheel that says, idiot check. Are you going to be the idiot today? And it's kind of like a terrible somber joke, but when we have dogs always around our vehicles, under our vehicles, and we, you know, are rushed, we're preoccupied, we're tired, we're thinking about a million other things, we're not thinking about looking under our vehicles. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of these mistakes end in, in tragedies. All right, so I feel like I, I missed a few points that I wanted to hit on. Uh, I really appreciate that you guys are willing to, to listen to this, and I, I do feel like I, I might have missed some points. So there are um, a lot more conversations to be had on this topic. So I own this pet safety company called Bark First Aid. So that's Backcountry Aid and Rescue Kit. I structure dog safety policies and resources to make that readily available for the workers so that they can make better, more educated decisions on their pet's behalf. I'd love to consult with you guys if you have dog-friendly camps. I'd love to hear what your concerns are, what your problems are, your pinch points, um, and build a better conversation around that with your workers. Um, and not just, you know, for the betterment of uh, the company, but ideally, I'm just really doing this for the dogs. I want to ensure that they're safe and they're well looked after. Um, I do offer... Oh, yeah, is there a question? Okay, yeah, hit me. Yeah, so they're, I, I'm guessing what they're asking is about like over-the-counter medication that you can get from pet stores. Um, really, the gold standard is like a veterinary, like prescription-grade tick medication. Um, that's really what's going to work. Um, often what we find in over-the-counter, it doesn't really, it, it's just not as effective. Um, and that's a really good question because ticks are a real um, zoonotic concern for us. I've actually had Rocky Mountain spotted fever from a tick. Uh, we have a lot of ticks in Fernie where I plant, so the dogs can inadvertently, um, you know, carry them into our tents, transmit them to us. So we really, yeah, um, prescription grade flea and tick medication is really the go from a vet. And and is it is it correct also that some of the tick and flea medications out there that are either given to the dog in a pill form or ingested? may not react well with your dog and there are certain um, genetic anomalies particularly with I believe Australian shepherds mm -hmm. and you might want to check with your own veterinarian to check on your dog's genetics just to make sure that it's not one of these breeds that carries a high chance of a very unhealthy and negative reaction to that specific medication so consult on the various different kinds of medications that may be available. Yeah white feet don't treat that's the saying, yeah, if they've got white feet, so if they're border collie type, Australian shepherd types, they may be an exception to that, but there is medication that manages it. Um, but yeah, very good point. So again, the reason why we need to bring our dogs to vet clinic so that the veterinarian can assess them and give them the appropriate medication. So, so Lynn, we're going to keep you up here for a few more minutes, mm -hmm. if that's okay, mm -hmm. because um, the courtesy bar will not be open until about five after five. Mm -hmm. And there were a few things that I want to follow up on. One of them is a point that you, you had on one of your slides, which said intact, um, unspayed or unneutered pets. And this mm -hmm. you, you identified as not a desirable um, animal for the workplace. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah. So, you know, with, with intact animals, usually they're a bit younger. Um, so again, kind of touching on that puppy point, um, ideally the age around one year or, or 18 months is kind of the ideal age that would be, we would be neutering our animals or spaying our animals. Um, animals that are intact tend to also just be at the center of a lot of issues uh, with fights with other dogs, or maybe they're the ones that are getting picked on by other dogs. We see a lot of like sex-driven behavior, so really um, rowdy. The females tend to get really rangy. Um, they're very bossy to other dogs. They can be very difficult to handle. Um, and we ideally do not want any accidental litters in camp, um, whoopsies litters. Uh, so we want to prevent that from happening. With older dogs, um, and perhaps this might not be appropriate for me to say, but the older dogs that are not breeding should not be intact. Should not be intact. Um, there's a lot of um, health con concerns with dogs that are intact. You know, for males, testicular cancer, prostate cancer, that's actually, you know, a very common thing for intact males. 
for females, uh, pyometra, which is essentially a massively infected uterus, which can rupture at like zero warning. Um, and that can be a life and death situation for those dogs. So yeah, there's a lot of concerns with like behavioral side, but also their health side. Bob Barker says, spay and neuter your pets. Yeah, so we love Bob Barker. There, there, was, um, there was another point I wanted to follow up on. Um, and this was about emergency drills for dogs. I love it. I've yet to see a dog perform an effective emergency drill. They always <laughs> seem to botch the C-spine. But anyways, um, uh, m more to the point, I think everybody here probably already struggles to do emergency drills. And I think, would it, would it be fair to say, this is an obligation that should be put on the dog owners. You want to have a dog in the camp. Part of the condition could be, I'm just taking this to make it practical, that you're going to have to do a, an emergency drill with the dogs, with the other dog owners, separate from what everybody else has to do. It, it should, I'm, I don't think it's, uh, I think it can be difficult to put that obligation on the company, but we also need to be looking at the obligations and the duties that we are going to place upon the owners of dogs as employers, as a condition of the privilege of having dogs in the workplace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Because I, I think the more you can practice something, the more well-versed you're going to be in it and the less you know, panicked and, and scary the situation will be. Um, if you guys have ever witnessed an injured animal in the bush or, you know, even just an accident or an injury or some sort of mishap, it's very stressful. It's very scary. I would imagine most of us here don't really have much experience with dealing with first aid for dogs. You know, we can maybe try and jimmy rig some duct tape and twine, but that really isn't enough for our dogs. They are very deserving of proper first aid care. Um, you know, dog ownership crosses a lot of different demographics, but what's really unique with our, uh, with our industry and our workers, our dogs are put at the most risk in very extreme and unforgiving environments, and they're the furthest away from veterinary care. So we really do become the first responders with our dogs when they're hurt or they're sick. Uh, so we need to know exactly what it is that we need to do to take care of them properly. We, we have another question from the online, a very good question, one of, I haven't encountered before. Can we talk about dog safety when everyone is going to a helicopter block and the dogs are left in camp? Often, care for the dogs falls to the cooks. As a cook, I don't have the time or energy to watch other people's dogs, and after having a dog die in camp, I won't watch them for other people anymore. What can people do to keep their dogs safe in a camp when they have to leave them at home alone for the day? I love that question because it's so hard to answer. So clearly there's a reason why um, that question needed to be asked. It's a really difficult thing to have, um, you know, a lot of dogs in camp left unattended. And that certainly does fall on the cooks or the project manager. Um, but we perhaps need to be a bit more discerning with who we're allowing in camp. For example, that behavioral assessment. Um, if we have owners and workers that are aware that their dog has separation anxiety, destructive behavior, um, you know, maybe is young and, and bold and doesn't know the rules or the boundaries of camp, um, it might not be the right environment for them. From the sounds of things, there's quite a few dogs in that camp that maybe shouldn't be there in the first place. We want dogs that are going to be safe if we leave them and if, you know, if we bring them. Yeah, and there's other things I think I can, you know, perhaps even just spitball and throw out a few ideas that um, there may have to be blocks. If there are blocks that day that are not helicopter blocked, that are not helicopter access, that might be where we prioritize the dog owners, or perhaps there's some sort of a pool put in by the dog owners to ensure that one of them is available to care for the dogs. There are other arrangements. These are things for the companies that do allow dogs to consider to make sure that the, the burden of, of having dogs, and there is a cost, there is a burden that goes along with it, doesn't accrue unequally on any member of the organization. Mm -hmm. Sylvia, I see you have your hand up. Mm -hmm. Just about puppies, um, there were two things. One, you a dog shouldn't come to a work environment that the owner hasn't had them for at least mm -hmm. six months, so mm -hmm. they can be assured of the training and reliability, no mm -hmm. doubt, for their... What, what's your sort of cutoff for puppies? I mean, I know yeah. breed variety also mm -hmm. plays into that, but what's your sort I of mean, idea could, there? It's a very individual answer. I think a lot of that has to do with their lifestyle. You know, if they're urban dogs that live in apartments and as puppies, their only experience with the outside world is on a leash in their neighborhood. You know, maybe they're not quite ready for that because that is a whole lifestyle change and that can be very dysregulating for puppies. Um, like anatomically speaking, 
Uh, dogs, their long bone physes, so their growth plates essentially don't stop growing until they're about 18 months of age, especially with our large breed dogs. So if we have puppies that are over-exercised from a young age, so picture, you know, my dog with big hips, um, they're much more prone for arthritis um, and any, yeah, any sort of hind end injuries in, in the long term. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Did you want to continue that question? Yeah, that's a yeah, that's a great question. She asked about extraction gear. Um, I will be here tomorrow, and I'll show you um, a, a really awesome jerry rig stretcher that you can make with just two long sleeve jackets, some ski poles, or a branch and just a strap. Um, I do have a like a rescue harness, um, but really the the biggest priority when we're talking about extraction is the safe handling, restraint and transportation of our animals. Um, a lot of people do tend to get that wrong. In the heat of the moment, they go to pick up their dog or they go to get their face right in the dog to deal with their injury. Um, and that really needs to kind of be on people's radar before we talk about like extraction devices. Um, because yeah, really handling injured animals in, in a stressful moment uh, can be very, very difficult. Uh, so knowing how to safely approach and transport them is, is really key. But yeah, I'll show you tomorrow. Mm -hmm. This is just another one um, to know if you've heard of this. It's something that I have actually used before on my one of my dogs and other people's dogs is extraction of porcupine quills, where mm -hmm. if you actually cut off the tip of the porcupine quill before you try to extract, it lets the air out and it makes it easier to extract the quill. Have you? So that's a very common misconception. <laughs> okay. That is wrong. Very clearly, um, yeah, and that's another problem that we have with dog ownership. There's a lot of opinion-based or perhaps, you know, varying information. Uh, as far as porcupine quills, um, we absolutely have to keep them intact. Um, the risk of cutting them or, or breaking them even is that they can migrate under the skin. Um, we've actually, in Revelstoke at the vet clinic, uh, we did a post-mortem on a dog that just collapsed, was otherwise healthy, died, keeled over and died. And his heart was completely full of porcupine quills. It migrates through the bloodstream, through soft tissue, through the bloodstream. Um, and so if we're not taking every single little quill out, they all have barbed ends on them, right? So, um, if, yeah, if we don't do that, there's a risk that they can migrate into, into internal organs and, and vital organs. Yeah, very lucky. Yeah. No, thank you for asking that, though. Because, yeah, again, I want to shift this culture on blaming people for, or shaming people for not knowing the right thing or not having difference of opinions. Um, but, yeah, we really want to keep our dogs safe here. There's one question way over there. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just continuing on. Sorry, I wasn't expecting so many questions, but thank you guys for asking those. Um, so some safety resources that we can get onto our workers' radar. This is actually a pet safety field guide manual that I've written. Um, it's just kind of like a flip brochure. Um, I think that this would be a great resource to include in your work sites and camp. It has all of the information that I was trying to get out to you guys earlier when I was stumbling with the leash and the, the little thing here. Um, but I want to share as much pertinent information that is vetted and to be true. So this is a great resource. I worked with quite a few veterinarians, some um, search and rescue dog handlers as well to uh, assemble this. So some of this information um, I touched on briefly, but to have this in your camps is a great thing for our workers to look on. Um, I am. Oh, sorry, yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, Jordan. I have a couple more things and I see the clock is ticking. Uh, I am a pet first aid uh, or a certified pet first aid instructor. So I teach a pet first aid course that's likened to like a human level one first aid course. So we cover the basics of wound management, um, certain medical conditions, uh, life-saving interventions such as CPR and uh, artificial, or sorry, artificial respiration and cardio CPR. Um, so that's an example of a uh, CPR dog. So we can actually practice that skill with the people in our class. Um, this is super fun. I've had a, a ton of fun teaching these courses. I've had uh, tree planters, working dog handlers, search, search and rescue dog handlers, 
um, lots of different dog owners from different backgrounds. Um, I think this is a re yeah, really valuable training to have. Um, so I've designed a pet first aid kit. Um, this has been the accumulation of a couple years of working in bush camps and realizing that dogs don't really have the same standard of first aid supplies um, that are you know, appropriate for them to use. So I have designed what's what I've called to be the glove box kit. So this is the essential pet first aid kit that I want every one of these camps, dog friendly camps to have um, in conjunction with pet first aid training for, for our workers. Um, lots of similar items to a human first aid kit, lots of different items. Um, but ideally, I would love to see every worker come with some form of pet first aid kit and training, but this is really the one that I want to see in every camp. All right, so yeah, there's a lot of information talking about dogs. It's really difficult to hit on all the points that I wanted to, um, but I really want you guys to know I care about dogs. I care about their safety. I'm also very well versed in their safety and I'm very aware of the risks that they face when they are in our industry. <clears throat> so if you have a dog friendly camp, if you are a pet owner and you want to talk to me some more, I've got some information here, my website, my email and a QR code to the website. Um, but yeah, let's work together to make our, our, our workers better owners for the dogs in the bush because really that's, that's why I'm doing it is to keep these dogs safe. Thank you so much, Celine. Mm -hmm. That was brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, there, there were many more questions, you know, questions that I think you've mm -hmm. touched the, the tip of the iceberg, things like, you know, how do we break up a dog fight, you know, and things like this. Um, there's one question, one last question that I'm going to bring in as my own question. I think we mm -hmm. all know the answer, and we all know the question. Who's a good boy? <laughs> Fella's a good boy. We know yeah. who's a good boy. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. I'm not sure. Do you want the chocolates? Uh, because dogs, yeah, no, let's chocolate, keep those away care. from the dog. All right, you yeah, keep those. You keep you. those safely away from the dog. Yeah. Um, I'd really like to thank Celine coming all the way from Mobilestoke and thank Fella for doing such a magnificent job. You really didn't do so. <laughs> Good job. Um, I'm just going to give a few wrap up directions to help direct us to the next stage of the evening and about what's coming tomorrow. So uh, thank you, Celine, for coming today.